Hello, I'm Billy Godbold. We're really excited to have you here at the Performance Engine Expo to talk about our new low shock technology camshafts. Me and everybody at CompCams is so excited about this. These new profiles are designed to do something where they load the system before going to max acceleration, reducing deflection on the opening side, also reducing spring surge. The idea is to give you better performance and better durability. So in this presentation, first we're going to go through a short video explaining the basic, basic technology of the Low Shock family. Then we're going to go in and talk about some of the products we have. The LS, the Hemi, all these different shelf cams that use this technology. Then you get to my favorite part where we talk about how do we apply this technology in racing and how we've been doing it for the past few years in all kinds of applications. Finally, we're going to go back and talk about some of the mistakes people make. When you have this new low shock technology, you have to treat the camshaft selection differently than you would for a traditional profile. Hopefully we'll be able to explain all that and give you an idea of what we've got in store for you from competition cams. In layman's terms, CompCam's low shock technology is a way we design a camshaft profile to load the system slightly before we accelerate the valve off the seat. The idea behind this is not to shock the spring not to create bad harmonics to allow us to do more throughout the valve motion vent. 20, 30 years ago, valve springs weren't nearly as good as they are today. In famous racers like Bob Glidden, even Jack Roush, they would take camshafts and if it accidentally got made with the master on backwards, sometimes that would run better. These camshafts had something like today's low shock. So what we've gone back is reinvestigated what we were doing in the 80s and 90s but improving upon it and trying to come up with a real, real sophisticated way of loading the valve train before we accelerate it aggressively off the seat. We're able to take what we've learned from the Spintron and really highly optimize where in the ramp does it need to be slow and where in the ramp can it be extremely fast. If you think about a pole vaulter running up and trying to jam his pole into the pit and throw himself over the, over the bar, that's how old cam designs work to an extent. Now the thing is, we used to think that the most we could squeeze the bottom of a lobe and the most we could expand the top of the lobe, the more power we'd have. And that generally worked. But what we're learning now is, it's not both sides that do this equally. The closing side really needs that area and it really needs that squeezing. But on the opening side, right as the valve starts to open, there's not a lot of air moving. So what we're trying to do is learn how to take care of our valve spring on the opening side so we can maximize the area later once we build up air speed and are really filling the cylinder. Whether you're racing in NHRA top fuel, whether you're in a pro mod, whether you're in a turbo outlaw car, no matter what the application, there are no performance drawbacks to slowly opening the valve at the very beginning of the motion. The reason being is Near top dead center, there's almost no air going through from the exhaust to the intake. What we're really trying to do is create a pressure wave to initiate that airflow movement. I'm a little bit more southern than northern, but if you think about somebody building a snowball, building a snowman, at the very top of the hill when they start rolling the ball, you have to start that ball rolling to make the big snowball at the bottom of the hill to wipe out your friends. But that ball isn't very big at the beginning very much the same way on a low shock technology we need to crack the door and get everything go open but we don't have to have the open the door open huge to get the snowball because at the very beginning top dead center small snowball when comp cams developed the lst type profiles we actually started not thinking about durability we started thinking about performance the whole idea was if we can come off the seat a little bit smoother if we can get a little bit better performance out of the valve spring, then we can do some things to get more air involved. Now what we kind of didn't expect when we first did it was that that would actually increase durability. In some professional drag racing classes where they were only getting six to eight passes out of a spring, some of the same customers all of a sudden called back and said, hey, we got 20, 20 passes on that valve spring. We got 30 passes on that valve spring. If there's one thing to take away from low shock technology, it's not power or durability, it's power and durability. By slowly putting in the force on the valve train system before we open the valve, we don't shock the valve spring 
we get more area on the back side, we better fill the cylinder, all while putting less stress and giving better durability from the entire system. Now that we've covered the theory of low shock technology, let's go and look at some of the things we're doing with it today. The first application that I think you guys will all find exciting, and certainly we have, is just how much this has picked up power with our HRT Hemi packages. Um, right now we have HRT packages for both the normally aspirated and the blown Hemi 5.7 and 6.4. And um, just to give you an idea, this slide shows a lot of the parts that come with it. We have a full match valve train where you have the cams, the new conical valve springs, the lifters, push rods, and the phaser limiter kit for it. And the cool thing about it is, here's a quick overview of the normally aspirated packages we have for the HRTs for the Hemi 6.4. You can see we have three different um, stage camshafts, the 1, 2, and 3. And power versus one versus the other, stage 1 was 75 horsepower, stage 2, 85 horsepower, and stage 3, 105 horsepower. And here's the overview of the power curves between the two with the stage three camshaft. And you can see that actually with this, with phaser locked, you were 105 horsepower peak to peak and 170 horsepower at 6,500 RPM. It would be impossible for me to overstate if you asked me four or five years ago, can you swap a cam on a Hemi and pick up more than 100 horsepower? I mean, I would have thought 30 to 50 would be a lot. 170 at 6,500 is just totally, completely unbelievable. And the cool part about this is these camshafts with this valve train package is actually more stable and more durable than any of the stock packages would be. So not only are you getting a great power package with this, you're actually getting better durability also. But it's really not just the Hemi that we've done these for. Actually, we started out on the LS packages a couple of years ago. This was our big rollout at SEMA and PRI last year. And you can see the LST cam packages that we have here for the GM applications. We did them for all different applications. And on this deal, we kind of thought about each package was like we named the guy who would want it. So for any normal thing, like if you had a max power LS3, if you had somebody who was doing a, a turbo 5.3, 5, if you had somebody that was upgrading their Corvette, we made all kinds of different packages, especially for them. And you can see this is a package of what would come in one of our kit, where you have the camshaft, the valve springs, the lifters, the push rod, and the timing set. The great thing about these kits is it takes all the guesswork out of component selection on a camshaft. You know, the camshaft and the valve spring and the lifter, they're all like dancing partners. They need to work together. And doing these kits made it where it took all the guesswork away from our customers. Okay, in this slide, we, we take a look at what the horsepower gain was on the LS. And going back to this LS3, 6.2 manual transmission, stock pistons. And pistons are real limiting in some of these newer motors. Like if you want to make great power on an LS or a Hemi, you could do more if you change the cam and the pistons together. But here in the stage two cam, just changing the camshaft with the valve train kit, we picked up 91 horsepower on our stage two camshaft on a LS3. So we went from, you look at this graph, went from around 480 horsepower to 576 horsepower. So pretty, pretty amazing gain just by changing the camshaft. You know, some things just go together like peas and carrots. And camshafts and superchargers is something that we learned as we merged the Edelbrock, just how much these work together. This 6.4 Hemi made over, with this package you're looking at on the right, it made over a thousand horsepower. And that's just with the parts you see on the right, even using the stock throttle body. So 6.4 unparted, unported factory heads made, as you see in this slide, 1,016 horsepower on E85. So that was just absolutely mind blowing. If you ever want to have a great day at work, come in, sit in the dyno room, and watch a 6.4 Hemi make a thousand horsepower over and over and over again. What we talked about for to this point is basically what we've been doing in the street world. And the low shock is absolutely wonderful for the street, but it was not developed there. You know, going back to what we talked about in the theory, it's not like that low shock was about trying to make things easier on parts or things better on power. But the idea was how can you get the performance and the reliability? So now let's look at the different type of race families. 
We'll go with the hydraulic rollers, the solid roller endurance, which would be your road race, things like that, 24-hour cars. The solid rollers for, um, and flat tappets for circle track, the drag race, top fuel, and finally overheads. On the race hydraulic roller side, we actually do have a couple of shelf cams for the 5.3 guys. This came about with our RHS packages where we put an intake manifold, did a camshaft and setups for that. With these parts, we got together and we made something that would really, really be a drop-in race package with our 54777-11 and 54778-11. In addition to these, we also made a bunch of different grinds for the 602, 603, 604, and even 525 circle track race engines for GM. Those camshafts to them, the flat tappets, the 12695-5 and 12696-5. The two rollers for the um, the 604 crate motors, the 08696-11 and 08697-11. And then for the LS, we have the 54696-11, 697-11. Well, not only did we come up with several new shelf camshafts for race applications, but more importantly for most engine builders, we actually are releasing different series for the hydraulic roller race custom grinds. The MGZ was our first series of, of profiles and those have been extremely good in both LS and earlier small block, big block Chevy and Ford race programs. But we added to that with the MGH, the MBZ, the MBX for big blocks, the LPM, LSD, XLD and LSO versions. We have a version for each different type of valve train stiffness where the rocker arm is kind of flimsy with the system like a big block Chevy or something that's extremely stiff like an LS. And you look at all these families, to date we have over 300 new hydraulic race roller race profiles just in the low shock family. Well the hydraulic rollers have been a lot of fun, but where the majority of our emphasis has been has been on solid roller race profiles. The first place where this came into being was in the 24-hour race and other high endurance applications, including some NASCAR type stuff. In this type family, we've added more than 450 new solid roller profiles. Um, if you talk to any of our salesmen, the series you want to ask about is our LGW, LXW, LIH, LHW, LXW. LDW, LKD, LX, LZX, LXE, LEB, on and on and on. All of these were added to our original stuff that we were running in the in classes like the Daytona prototypes and GTLM cars. Those would be series like our LDP, LRP, XDP. Basically, we've taken everything that we had in a traditional profile for endurance racing, and now we offer a very similar profile that's better on performance, better on stability, better on durability for these applications. Now, for the circle track racers, they need something just a little bit spicier than what you put in a 24-hour car. So we have over 300 new roller profiles and over 100 new flat tappet profiles for circle track racing. When we started making new solid roller profiles, we looked at what's most popular today. Generally, that'd be our HXL, HXX type profiles. So to have a corresponding setup for that, we made our LRW and then we made our LRX for the exhaust. As we made that, we found out there was a lot of different applications that could be made better. So we made lobes that are much faster, like the LDW, and made even things that are smoother. In addition to that, we took some of our TK setups and made a low shock version of that, the new NTK and NTK LL. As we started to do the flat tap, we also noticed there was a lot of demand for low lift and high lift 842 and 875 applications. And that's really good for the low shock because some of the 842, the low lift especially, requires a very small spring. And where low shock really, really shines is when you have a limited spring. So the new LTW, the LTF, the LLF, all of these new series are designed to work in flat tappet applications, adding the new low shock opening ramp. Well, all of this has been fun, but now let's go to the solid roller drag race. The solid roller drag race may be our most expansive series of low shock technology. We have everything here from Mount Motor Pro Stock all the way down through Comp Eliminator, Super Stock, any type of profile that you might want. Of these 500 new profiles, probably our most popular right now is our MMO and MMX. What makes these things so great is somebody in a sportsman application who wants to run a lighter spring and run more passes between lash adjustment or spring changes 
can throw this in with a more standard 1.7, 1.8 rocker ratio and perhaps go all season with it. Then again, somebody who's running comp eliminator can put more rocker arm on these families and go, go much more aggressive with them when you put up like a 2 to 1 rocker. The cool thing about low shock is these really, really are hard to over rocker, especially in these first MMO MMX. As you go further down the list toward the MBW, toward the MJW, even on toward the LX at C, each step down this list goes to a faster, more aggressive profile. But there's just about something for everybody in this list. What may surprise you, I guess you people think about is drag race, but top fuel is almost its own animal. The reason that it's so much different is with the high cylinder pressures the exhaust has to open with, if you're familiar with nitromethane, it burns really slow, so it creates a lot of pressure exhaust opening. This creates a lot of deflection on the opening side. Back in 2018, when we were first really developing the low shock technology, we did a couple of these profiles for Clay Milliken, and he did a tremendous job with it. Um, one of the first camshafts we ground with this set a national record at 362.8 at 322 miles per hour. In these families, we've done a dozen or more new profiles and four new series, four just for top fuel. What made it clear we need low shock was looking at a divot we actually saw on the opening ramp on the exhaust. The plot on the right here is an ag coal report after a camshaft was, was ground and after it had been run in an engine several times. What shocked us is when we looked at the exhaust, we would see this big divot in the opening flank. The crazy part about it was this divot was 20 degrees after the exhaust valve was supposed to open. This corresponds to almost a hundred thousandths tap at lift before the valve was breaking the seal. Knowing we had this much deflection before we actually moved the valve had us totally rethink what should a top fuel exhaust opening ramp look like. Finally, let's talk about something that may surprise some of you. Not only is the low shock ramp great in normal overhead valve applications, but it actually works great and even better maybe in overhead cam applications. For the past few years, we've been developing several of these, mostly on professional race teams on a case-by-case -case application, so not much in the catalog yet. As far as catalog grinds for overheads, all of our new 2018 UP Coyote camshaft sets, each of these use the low shock ramp, a new low shock design on the opening side, and we're offering those for other Coyote applications as well. Basically, the increased stiffness of, of the overhead valve train will actually help you with the low shock technology because you don't get as much wind up in the system. And instead of being better in an overhead valve than an overhead cam, this technology may be just as good or even better in an overhead cam than what we saw in the overhead valve world. Low shock cam profile selection. Let's think about now, how do we need to relearn picking a camshaft with a low shock ramp? The odd part about it is low shock cams, because they're so asymmetric, they're going to require a different thought process. Let's cover that here. Let's talk about how we were all taught to compare two profiles. Basically, when I started in the tech office in 95, all of the older guys told me just look for a camshaft that's at 50. If you want to compare another one, take the one with the smallest number at 20 because it'll have the most responsiveness, make the, lowest tor the most torque down low. Then look for the one with the biggest 200 number and you know it'll make the most power. And so any profile that was small at 20 and big at 200 was always your best choice. Well, I say always, almost always. Sometimes if it was really small at 20 and really big at 200, it would throw parts out of the valve cover and that was bad. So let's go back and say, you were taught the smallest at 20, biggest 200 that didn't throw parts at you. That was the cam you wanted. So let's look at what we're talking about when we say small at 20 and big at 200. This blue curve shows you in red, the duration at 20, blue, the duration at 50, and black, the duration at 200. Basically, the more we squeeze the red dots together and the more we spread the black dots apart, the better the cam was in every application, assuming no exit wounds again. Well, Billy, how can that possibly be wrong? Well, first of all, we knew that didn't work on the exhaust because sometimes you put a little bit softer exhaust lobe and it would make more power, but you never really saw that on the intake. The reason we were wrong is we didn't really think about what was going on differently on the opening side and the closing side. 
So if you don't really think about what's limiting the duration you select and what's going on, you can kind of paint yourself in a corner where you think something's important when it really isn't. Okay, Billy, so what really limits the selection of an intake duration? Well, we knew for duration at 50 it was the min and max RPM. That's absolutely tri true, but why is it true? Number two on this list is actually probably should be number one, and that's piston to valve. Now, this makes more sense on race than it does on street. Um, on street, you may be more on number three, idle stability. But still, with modern motors, they don't have a lot of room. So on the opening side, about 10 degrees after top dead center, if you don't have the lift under X amount, you're going to crash the valve into the piston, and that's never good. Moving on to number three is idle stability. And this is very true on the street. When you open the intake is going to determine how stable the idle will be at a certain RPM. That has everything to do with like putting your car in drive, picking up kids in the kindergarten riding line, trying to use power brakes more than one time. There's numerous applications where you need to have idle vacuum to get idle stability. Number four, and this is always true, is low RPM performance. Whether it's when you're trying to get a um, throttle response out of a street car, or whether you're trying to drive off the corner on a circle track car, or whether you're trying to launch a drag race car. If you don't make power at low RPM, the, the, the engine will respond, will just act horrible. You know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, that thing's over cammed and acts like a pig. Um, I'm not sure why a pig is bad, but it probably is. Number five, high RPM performance. The intake closing the lift, all this area under the curve, that's what you need to get um, when you're picking a camshaft. You have to know how much RPM that you're going to turn. You can't put to something that's 218 at 50 and try to turn 10,000 RPM. Well, why? Well, the intake closing is way too early. It's slamming the door in the oncoming air. Well, let's see. Instead of talking so much about theory, let's go into and do a application you guys might be familiar with. If you talk to most guys who run sprint car and ask them do they run a 109 or 105 lobe separation camshaft and which one would be more responsive, everybody would say 105 would be more responsive. Well, why? Well, one thing we know for sure is the intake closing helps, but is that all? When you're on 105, that's going to close the intake four more degrees, four degrees sooner than if you're on 109. But we know that it's not just the intake closing because we could have got that with duration. We know that a smaller cam on a 109 with the same intake closing is not as good coming off the corners. So what's going on there? Well, the bigger 105 is better off the corners because it opens the intake sooner. Once you have a good header, the reflective exhaust wave that you get from exhaust opening is going to be reflected up the pipe come into the chamber and it creates a large pressure differential at intake opening. This large pressure differential is what causes this 105 lobe separation cam to work so good. It means as soon as you crack the intake, you're going to start intake mass moving in early, allowing it to build a momentum. And this goes back to the snowball rolling downhill that we talked about in our theory. Well, okay, hey, look, we just discovered if we open the intake sooner, we're going to have better power, we're going to have better responsiveness. Well, this is easy. Let's just start grinding everything on a 102 lobe separation. We're all going to be rock stars. Well, here's where I do my Lee Corso impression say, not so fast. Open the intake early will help build that intake charge momentum, especially where you're in the power band with the headers proper length. But the problem is, as you open that intake sooner, you also add lift at that 10 degree after top dead center. And that requires big valve reliefs. Well, if we grind it on this tight center and we have to put these big valve reliefs, now we've carved up the top of the piston. Now that's killed compression. But you go, okay, Billy, I'll put a pop-up piston and I'll get my compression back. Well, you can do that, but now you've torn up the geometry of the whole piston. So you've made a really bad flame speed. You know, basically, the, from the time you spark the plug, you can imagine this wave front of flame front having to go over the hills and through the woods to grandma's house to get to the other side of the mountain. Well, okay, that makes some sense about the idea of the combustion chamber getting messed up. So why have we seen the LSA numbers get wider over time? 
And the truth here is combustion efficiency. When you think about any four-stroke motor, you only have two knobs that you can really turn to make more power, at least at a given cubic inches at a given engine speed. You can either increase the airflow, which people talk about volumetric efficiency, or you can improve the efficiency of the combustion, which is how much power you get out of each drop of fuel, commonly known your brake-specific fuel consumption. Brake-specific can also be from frictional loss, so you can look at that either way. So basically, you've either got to improve VE or you've got to improve brake specifics. The problem is this earlier, tighter lobe separation with earlier intake opening, it will help your volumetric efficiency. But oftentimes, these big valve reliefs hurt your brake specifics more than the earlier intake valve opening helps your volumetric efficiency. So that's why we see these wider and wider lobe separations. Well, not only does the opening of the valve not do the same thing in terms of airflow as the closing of the valve, there's also something else to consider. Does a symmetric lobe result in symmetric valve motion? The answer is absolutely not. The valve only reacts to what has happened. It doesn't get to see ahead of time and what's going to happen. Anybody that needs to think about this, remember when you first started going to school and you walked in and you saw people and everything like that? You couldn't know how the teacher was going to behave. You couldn't know how the class was going to go. You only knew what your last teacher in your last class was. The valve and the valve spring are exactly the same. They can't see the future. They saw the opening ramp they went up, but until you load the system enough to get the valve to come off the seat, it can't look ahead to see what's about to happen to it. So basically, if you think of a valve like a teenager, you know, my wife and I have five kids, so you can kind of figure out what goes on there. But when you think of a teenager playing video games, you can ask the teenager to get off the couch and do something. But it's going to take some force, whether it's like physical force or threat of losing a phone, to actually get the teenager off the couch and to do what you want to do. Valve train's not much different. So we've talked about a little bit of the why. Why does the intake opening matter? Why does intake closing matter? Why do these things not do what you say? Okay, so practically, if we're going to use a low shock globe, what do we need to do? Well, the first thing is, I would say, instead of looking at major intensity, which is the, the difference in the duration at 20 minus the duration at 50, and that's how your old guys were taught to look at it, instead of looking at a major intensity as a whole, let's start looking at it as a split. So a traditional 30-degree major intensity might be 14 degrees on the opening side and 16 degrees on the closing. But that camshaft may not act as quick as a new 33 degree major intensity, low shock that has 18, 15 split. So that 15 on the closing is going to change things more than going from 14 to 18 did on the opening. So let's look at some applications and see if we can find out how we might change the camshaft when we went from a conventional grind to a low shock grind. Case one, typical big block Chevy race drag race cam. Okay, our most common camshaft grind for a sportsman drag race big block Chevy would be our RX drag intake and XCX exhaust. So let's say a customer has our 1728 intake, 316 at 20, 283 at 50, 203 at 200, and 496 left. And what we wanted was is something that was, was not hard, as hard on valve springs, but actually made more power. So if we went our normal way going from a regular profile to a low shock, we'd jump over to that MMO lobe, lobe number 24139, that's the same 316 at 20, 283 at 50, a degree bigger 204 at 200, and 490 lift. And so it has virtually the same major intensity and size on the same centers. Well, let's look at the graph and see what happens when we grind this camshaft. Here's the overlay of that 1728, 1772, 115 versus the new low shock 24, 139, 11799 on 115. Looking at the intake here, you can see the earlier intake opening with the low shock profile in red. You can also see at 10 degrees after, the piston of valve is almost exactly the same. There's a little less lift with the 490 versus the 496, but 
just like it was much earlier on the intake opening, it's also much earlier on the intake closing. And on this graph, it may not look this way, but that's a four degree earlier intake closing with the new profile. So now that we've seen that graph, what will we know? Okay, when we look at the graph, the thing that came, struck out to me was that earlier intake opening is the first thing. We've actually opened the intake earlier, but we have the same piston to valve. Thinking back to what we talked about, about our tight lobe separation sprint car cam, that it'd be really good to be a 102 lobe separation, but you can't because of the piston to valve. Well, here's a way that you actually get an earlier intake opening to start creating that signal, yet you don't take up all the room in the combustion chamber that's going to kill you when you're trying to make compression without having the over the hills and through the woods to grandmama's brake specific fuel consumption limit. However, just like we opened the intake earlier, we also closed it earlier. And that's going to be a bear. This cam that looks like it's the same is actually going to act like it's four degrees smaller. So instead of acting like a 283 low, it's going to act like a 279. It might even act like a 277 because of that four degree earlier intake closing. So Billy, how do we do it right? Well, what we've got to do is remember that the intake closing is our absolute most sensitive of all of the valve events. So we need to make sure when we go from a regular cam to a low shot cam that we don't really move intake closing more than a degree or two. So taking advantage of low shot, look at this new red curve versus blue curve. You can see that I went to the 24210B intake lobe and I went to that on a wider 116 lobe separation. What did this buy me? Well, what it did was we still have the earlier intake opening. We still have the same piston to valve. But what I've done now is I've added more backside area with the same intake closing. You can see where that cursor is going up and down. That I have 32 thousandths more lift, valve lift, around that 180 to 220 range after TDC. A lot of people don't understand it, but there's tremendous flow while the piston's sitting there around 180 to 240 from top dead center when it's sitting around bottom dead center. The piston's barely moving, but you still have all this momentum in the intake track that's ramming the combustion chamber full of air. So by increasing the, the valve lift in this region, we're really continuing to flow, to flow in the intake stroke well after we've reached bottom dead center. But we're doing this while still achieving the same intake closing. When you do this, not only do you get a camshaft that makes great torque down low, that's very, very easy on parts, but now we have something where we can actually make more power up high and run even better past peak power. Okay, let's review what we've learned. We know that intake closing is super important. We know that any new low shock profile is going to close the intake valve sooner, and that's going to make the camshaft act small. We have two ways of counteracting that. Either we can add some duration, or we can add a little bit on the lobe separation to move that intake center line back. My recommendation would be do a little bit of both. In the case we just covered, we went plus four on intake duration, and that would have been just about perfect, but we lost a bit of piston of valve. So I went ahead and just instead of adding four degrees of intake duration, we added one degree of lobe separation and two degrees of intake duration at 50. And that's a great start. With a smoother lobe, we now we can run more lift because we know we're not lofting as much. And a lot of times with these older profiles, because they did loft, we had to run it too far from behind anyway. Be sure that you note that we increased this backside lift 32 thousandths. I can't overstate how important that is. With this plus two duration at 50, and this one degree wider lobe separation, we still have an earlier actual intake valve opening than we had with the other camshaft. We know that's going to help us with responsiveness. And honestly, in a drag race application, not only are you interested in responsiveness, but you also need to worry about shift recovery. The same things that make an engine very responsive to throttle changes will also make it very, very good when it comes to shift recovery with the change of RPM. 
What we did also know is we have to be willing to cheat duration up or load separation out to match the intake closing when we go to a low shock. When we were starting to introduce low shock camshafts to both drag racers and circle track racers, over and over again, we'd send them a camshaft that was way, way, way better at low end and responsiveness and peak torque, but didn't make any more power. If we do it right, we can make the engine perform better completely across the board by cheating a little bit on the duration and center lines while going to the new low shock profile. Let's look at the same thing in a late model or, or sprint car type application. If we look at our original 12280R, 12201R, 108, and then we just changed the intake load from the 12280 to the new 23809, again spreading the load separation out from 108 to 108 and a half, changing the advance from 2 degrees, which would be a 106 intake center line, to 1.5, to bring you out to a 107 intake center line. We can see exactly the same thing in the circle track application as we saw in the drag race. If you look at the red line, you can see the earlier intake opening before top dead center, the same piston of valve, but again, we're increasing the backside area with the same intake closing. Just like on the drag race, this is the front part of it's going to make it easier on the valve spring, the front part's gonna help you with throttle response, and then the back part is going to help you make more power past peak. It's not just in drag racing and circle track where this works. Honestly, it works in any application you can imagine. Below is a endurance solid roller for LS, 14881 road race cam versus the 23761 in red. If you looked on paper, the 23761 would look softer at 20 and 200, but when you look at it, on how it would actually be run, you can see that all that softness is actually where either you'd be limited on piston to valve or before top dead center on the intake opening where we said we really want a little more duration there. If you look on the back side, you see that the intake closing is exactly the same spot. So in this case, instead of trying to gain more power, all we did here was to create something that looked like it would be softer but makes exactly the same power as the earlier design, just being easier on parts. So, if a customer or anyone's thinking about taking their traditional cam out and going to a low shock profile, what should we think about doing? Well, number one was just if you're looking at duration at 50, don't be afraid to start about plus two degrees from where you were. If you're running 260, look at 262. If you're running 280, look at 282. Secondly, don't be scared of a slightly wider lobe separation. Everybody has had it driven in their head over and over again. As you widen lobe separation, you lose responsiveness. With a traditional profile, that's going to be somewhat true. But when you go to the low shock, because of the, er the earlier intake opening, you're always going to gain responsiveness. So let's take a little bit of what we gain and trade it off by going to a little bit wider lobe separation so it can make even more power. Number three, it is going to be easier on springs, but it's likely not to loft as much. So oftentimes when you go to a low shock profile, you should look at some of the more lift or maybe look at some of the more rocker ratio or even look at a valve spring that has a little less open load. You know, trying to tell somebody in pro stock that instead of 1,500 pounds open, they might be okay with 1,300 pounds open makes them a little crazy. But really, that's what these profiles are about. Being able to run either more lift, more ratio, less valve spring, and do the same thing. Number four, it's more than okay to ask your salesman for overlays, especially earlier in swapping from a, from a standard profile to a low shock profile. Probably two or three times a day, I send an overlay to one of our salesmen to show them what the old cam they were thinking about was versus the new cam. The reason you can do this is if you look at these overlays like, like I'm shown her earlier, it really helps you get your first cam into the ballpark so then you can tune things from later. Lastly, let's think about what we're really doing. With increased overlap, you know, opening that intake valve earlier, 
we're giving you more time for the intake system and exhaust system to communicate during overlap. What this is causing shows up a little bit at steady state on the dyno, but we're seeing big changes on the track. We've seen customers where they picked up five horsepower on the dyno, go to both either a drag strip or to a circle track, and being able to see what was going on on the time slip or on the stopwatch. There's absolutely no reason why these customers should have seen five horsepower on the stopwatch or on their time slip. So something's going on with that earlier intake opening to create better throttle response or an engine that goes through RPM changes like shift recovery and pro stock better than anything was going before. So absolutely positively, I would recommend if you try a low shot cam and it just shows a little bit ever so slightly on the dyno. Try to run it on the strip once you get it out to the track because we really aren't good at, at measuring transient responsiveness on dynos, at least without spending a couple million dollars on AVL. Let's go out to the racetrack and see what this new load profile, how it responds on the track. If you can do those type tests and get back with your salesman, I 100% believe you're going to see some big improvements with these new profiles. Every time we get involved in something, what we really want to see at Comp Cams is you, our customers, have more and more success on the, on the track to do better with your competition. Um, these profiles offer a very unique opportunity to go into a new world of cam design. In my 25 years at Comp Cams, and I guess 24 of it over valve train, uh, valve train development, I haven't seen a single thing come along that made as much difference on the track as what we've been seeing over the past two years with the low shot camshafts. I invite you and welcome you to try to join this, take advantage of it, and see if you can use it in your application. Well, I wanted to thank you guys again for all your attention. It's been certainly a privilege to talk to you at this conference to go over what we're doing with this new low shock technology. We certainly appreciate your attention, your time, letting us talk about it. And we really look forward to servicing you at Comp Cams. Everybody here wants you to know that we appreciate our customers and we're really excited to have this new technology out in the field to help you guys win races. We're back live here at the Engine Performance Expo. Myself, Joe Costello, Lake Speed Jr. We got Billy Godbold from Comp Cams. Before we bring on Billy, my goodness, that video has got me so inspired, fired up, big crowd of people inside the uh, our little lounge area watching the video. We now know how Clay ran 362. Amazing stuff. Lake, this is, I'm fired up about this one. Well, this is great. This is what I was hoping for. You know, Billy is just such a brilliant, communicator and educator. I mean, one, he's a brilliant cam designer, obviously, but he's really great at bringing out those analogies that, that illuminate that point so we, us dumb people, yes, exactly. can understand because he is a nuclear engineer. Actually, he had a PhD up in that wall back there, you know, from some school, a little bit the road from where you are, but we won't go there though. Yeah, but you know what the, uh, yeah, Billy, I just gonna want to mention wide right but I won't tell you anything else. Uh, oh! <laughs> burn! I'm checking out, God. <laughs> I lost God. Billy. In, in two words, I lost Billy. But hey, it's good to know that a, a nuclear engineer has trouble getting his teenager off the couch. Uh, hey, so, you know, it's a great analogy. Billy, hey. welcome. How are you? I was just kidding, man. I was just kidding. Oh, we're doing great. Hey, thank you guys so much for having us here. Um, I really enjoyed the conference. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed today watching Warren Johnson, really seeing him come out of the shell, you know, hearing from Ed Pink. What a legend. I mean, I'm very humbled to be part of this thing. It's been a great, great seminar. Oh, absolutely. And I, I got to tell you, though, you've been really uh, amped up. I can tell you're answering questions throughout, asking questions answering questions and uh, i know a lot of people are going to have questions at the conclusion of our conversation right here and so i will uh, ask you not to answer their questions anymore billy so we can <laughs> we can go through our format but no you're obviously very um this is your passion oh absolutely i mean i grew up in a farm in mississippi i do have the nuclear physics background but you know um i'm a gearhead at heart um, i'm a tinkerer at heart um 
I love the guys who work in the machine shops, the guys who do all the hands-on work. You know, those are the real heroes of our industry. Um, it's kind of neat that they let us as, as kind of the engineers and the science guys. You know, these guys let us come play in their world. And it's amazing to actually build a lifetime career getting to tinker with engines to get to make horsepower. It's, it's my favorite thing. I can't imagine doing something else. Like, oh, it's just awesome. I mean, Billy is the guy that taught me the word profilometer. You know, if, if, if you go, that's been a big word the last two days. Surface finish. I mean, how many times have we talked about surface roughness, surface finish? Billy's the guy that taught me how to run a profilometer and what that means. And one of the things that Billy talked about uh, in the past, I'm not sure it was in the video, but that failures typically begin at a micro level, not a macro level. Uh, put it in different terms, the failure you see on that part didn't begin at a level that you can see it. It actually begins at a micro level that you can't see. And that's where the technology that they have at, at comp cams with the profilometers and things like that, that's what allows them to do the things like they're doing with the, the low shock lobe technology and the spintrons and things like that. It all comes out of the fact that they've got great resources because they are, they're passionate and committed to making power, making durable power, just like Ed said. Billy, talk a little bit about the, we just learned about the low shock lobe technology, but what caught my ear was when you first started the experts, the old guard experts in the way that they had done it and to reintroduce or reinvent the wheel, so to speak, like that, that not only does it take courage, but it's kind of hard to, to try to blaze a new trail as you guys have. You know, I was so fortunate at comp cams. Um, you know, Scooter Brothers was my mentor. He, he's been almost like family for me for years and years. And um, guys like him, uh, Gordon Holloway, who was one of our first salesmen, these guys all really took me under my wing, under their wings when I was in my early 20s. And, um, you know, they all would, you know, it was interesting because they like one of the first people I met in the industry was um, Scooter introduced me to a young engineer who used to work here you know, over a summer to Doug Yates and uh -huh. got to start working with him when I was in my 20s and nobody knew much about either one of us. And, you know, that whole thing is that um, you would be surprised just how welcoming the old guard was to young people getting in, especially young people who showed a passion young people who showed some effort, you know, some ability to actually help things. And, you know, it was amazing how quickly, um, you know, I was involved in NASCAR in development before I'd been at comp for more than, you know, 12, 18 months. I think that's a really well said thing, Billy, that that old guard, while they may seem intimidating because they're the guys who have all the records and everything, they really have embraced young people that come into the industry that have passion. You know, we were talking about presenting that award to Ed. That, that's why I was getting choked up trying to, to do that because he, here's this legend of the industry. I'm a nobody, yet he's sharing information. Say, yeah, next time you're in town, come on, let's go eat dinner. We'll talk about these things. Let's guide you through your career and give you advice. And that's the greatest gift is not sometimes having the, the formula necessarily, oh, X plus, you know, Y equals Z. It's that how do you think about that? How do you create your own formula? Just like Warren was saying, every engine is different. There is no magic bean you can buy that's just gonna make all your stuff run good. You have to learn to think, I think is what he said. And I think that's the key is if we can learn to think, and these old guys do, they know how to think. They can help you along and, and Next thing you know, maybe you're one of those guys. Who knows? So exactly. All right. So we have uh, opened the floor for questions. Billy, go ahead. You had an answer right there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking for questions now for folks to please put them in the comments section. This first okay. one from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're, well, they're asking questions. I wanted to say something, you know, with like, you know, like, you know, you and I in our generation, we have the responsibility 
to do what the Ant Pinks, Kenny Dellars, the Scooter Brothers, John Cosby, all those guys, they took us under their wing when we were young guys. Now as we're becoming the gray hairs of the bunch, me more so than yours if I can keep any hair, um, you know, it's our responsibility to do this for the next generation. And we have a team of about a dozen young engineers here at CompCams, and it has been some of the most enjoyable part of my job is to watch them grow and learn and everything like that. And so I think individually, everyone at our, at our stage in our career, we really need to be watching the next, next group and trying to do exactly the same that we were allowed, letting these next guys kind of show what they can do. Uh, agreed, and I think that's kind of the heart, the ethos, if you will, of the Engine Performance Expo is, you know, that was the biggest thing to get Warren to do this, is that, Warren, you know these things, don't let it just effervescence away. This is your chance to share that. And he's like, yeah, I'm in. I I'm willing to drive five hours uh, from Atlanta, come up here to talk for an hour or two, and then drive back five hours so he can do more engine work tonight. Why? Because he wants to pay it forward and wants to do it. And that's hopefully what we're accomplishing here is providing that information to the next generation of engine builder, next generation of racer, so this, engine, this industry continues to grow and prosper. Yes, absolutely. Now? Yes. All right. Questions. First from Nick. How does resonance in the intake and exhaust tracks affect cam profiles? Well, really, if you're trying to get more than 100 percent volumetric efficiency, the resonance is how you do it. You know, a lot of people start thinking about port links and resonance, and they want to start with the intake link. And really, if you want to do it well, you have to start with the exhaust opening. Exhaust opening is the highest pressure event across the valve of any of the four events. As soon as you open the exhaust valve, there's going to be this high pressure wave going at the speed sound out the exhaust pipe, out the exhaust port, through the pipe to the header. As it gets in the header, when it sees either the collector or a step, there'll be a reflective wave. Now, when a, when a pressure wave hits an opening, it reflects back in the opposite opposite deal. There's a high pressure going in, be a low pressure when it turns around. So high pressure wave goes out the header, it hits a step, it reflects it back as a low pressure. The idea is the time between exhaust opening and, and intake opening so that that low pressure hits the intake opening at when that low pressure wave hits. And what that does is let that snowball start building earlier. That's what gets everything going. So exhaust opening starts it, that ties back from that length to intake opening. You want to use that intake opening to start pulling to create that, that motion, create that pressure differential. And then you have, as soon as the intake opens, you create the low pressure intake track. As it goes back at the speed of sound to the plenum, it's reflected back as a high pressure wave. And you have to tune it so that intake closing happens about where that high pressure comes back to the valve. Now there are overtones of that, of course, it's not the first order, you know, it's a, it's a later order, but it's all about pressure wave tuning. And it's, it's more important that you can imagine. Um, there's a lot of mass that actually, even though the peak piston velocity is at 70 degrees after around there, your peak air, air mass flow into the cylinder can be almost somewhere between peak lift and bottom dead center. You're still moving a tremendous amount of air at bottom dead center. So I think to really understand a four stroke motor, you have to understand wave tuning. If you want to understand wave tuning, start at exhaust opening and work through all four events and what's going on. Oh, there you go. Richard wants to know, it appears as though the low shock design actually has a higher rate of acceleration change at certain places in the profile. Is that correct? Absolutely. You know, if you're going to, you know, the low shock, you know, the guys that come up, sometimes they call it low shock, we'll call it crack and whack. So the idea is, if you look at, if you go to an NHRA event, you watch a um, NHRA um, stock eliminator car. You know, it may have a 50 pound flywheel and they rev it up to the thing, they drop the clutch and it pulls the, the wheels up in the air, does a whole lot of up and down and then goes out. If you wait a few, um, you wait a few rounds, you'll see, see um, a pro mod car come up and it doesn't do any jumping up and down. They don't rev it up, they actually leave from nearly an idle and just shoot out from the, um, from the line. Just like that, you can think of an old profile as trying to hit it as hard as you could right off the line, where with blow shock, 
you accelerate a little slower earlier, but you're going to higher and higher acceleration later. Otherwise, you'd never catch up and you wouldn't make the power of the low shot because you do it regular. But still, the whole idea is by accelerating later, you won't upset the bow spring, you won't upset the system, you won't put all that stored energy in the push rod and rocker arm that can lead to a loss of control later. Excellent. Uh, what about cubic inches? A lot of uh, people asking, like, is there a displacement limit to use that low shock technology? No, no. We, we've used them in everything from a Briggs and Stratton. Actually, whatever replaced the Briggs and Stratton, the go-kart world, like, you know this better than I do, but the Raptor motor, the animal, we've used everything yeah. from a Raptor motor all the way up to anything that Kazi or Sunny has built. Excellent, excellent. And uh, people, multiple asking about with uh, flat tappet, does that technology translate? You mentioned roller. What about flat tappet? Is it uh, also applicable? Yeah, we've had a, we've where we've really seen the biggest deal so far in the flat tappet is the classes that have the limited valve spring. You know, they have to run the single spring, the one two fifty spring. In that application, that um, that low shock because it doesn't upset the valve spring. It's been tremendous in some of the limited flat tappet. We've also used it in some very open flat tappet and done a tremendous job with it there too. So it's absolutely not just a roller cam technique. Um, we used it in overheads, we used it in flat tappets. Uh, Jeff, Hydraulic solids, just about anything you can imagine. Excellent. Uh, does comp have the new lobes in a master catalog? Uh, I just got a refresh. Uh, like the old lobes are. So is there a, a master catalog for, for the new technology? You know, we started the low shock, the low shock work about three years ago, you know, that, that clay period. It's also some things going on in, in the NASCAR world where we really were focusing on it. Um, over time, we've built sub-series to it, but we've never published a list of these low shock profiles. Um, we're doing a seminar with our salesman in February. I assume at that time, somewhere in there, we'll probably have a, um, a cumulative listing of these. Right now, we have like sub listings. We have a listing for drag race, we have a listing for circle track, we have a listing for endurance. But we don't have everything put together. Hopefully, Brian Hosenfeld's been working on it. I imagine we will have something here in the next few months. All right, so th this happened yesterday. It's happening now again today. John Cosby is out there, and he says, Billy, <laughs> tell them about when I decided to close the exhaust 20 degrees earlier on the big engine and lost 300 horsepower. Yeah, I mean, you think about these valve timing setups, and, um, you know, John had done something on the cylinder head, and it flowed less air. And I think when it flowed less air, he's like, oh, okay, we'll do this and this. Let's just move this intake closing in like 20 degrees. And I'm like, John, are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's let's try that. And, um, you know, I got the call back and John was just so impressed with himself. And I'm like, what are you so happy about? He's like, Billy, Billy, I lost 300 horsepower. I didn't know you could lose 300 horsepower. You know, and just, you have to understand John's personality, um, you know, he is he is as much fun to work with and is as much fun to have as a friend as any human being I've ever known. And to watch him laugh over, you know, we really just about laughed till we cried after losing 300 horsepower. You would have thought we'd gained 300 horsepower as happy as we were. But um, just so you know, don't try to go from 280 duration to 250 duration. If 280 was pretty good, 250 is going to be pretty bad. <laughs> and you move the needle, though. <laughs> you know. He moved the. Well, um, yes, he he significantly moved the needle. <laughs> well, exactly, and uh, well, John will have his opportunity tomorrow. Um, what about uh, stock eliminator? Has low shock been tried in stock eliminator? How does the technology uh, work with categories that are severely restricted through rules and regulations? Well, you know. Um, <laughs> I hate to be, I hate to say anything that can be used to try to figure out who's running what. But um, but I'll let you know that probably NHRA stock eliminator has been as significant of an increase in performance of anything we've seen, um, especially with the factory shootout cars. Um, and I hope nobody in NHRA is listening, but you know, <laughs> they have this, this cool idea. They, they think, okay, if a certain make is going faster than the other, we'll just take away pulley size from them. Well, you know, that just plays right into my hands because 
if you've got a given set of pulley to run on a blower, how do you turn the blower faster? Easy, you just turn the crank faster. So what are we doing there? We just run more RPM. And that has been an absolute blast. You know, um, some of the NHRA factory shootout cars, you know, we have those cars to bring RPM safely that you can never imagine. And I don't think we could have done it without the low shot profiles. And so now we know how you tested the, uh, the technology on the overhead cams. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> right? Um, it's mm, race proven. Mm. <laughs> Here, here you go. Julian is in Melbourne, Australia, where I hear they have great coffee. They do. Are the uh, low shock technology lobes going to be available on the uh, 875 Ford Cleveland flat tappet profile? Absolutely. There's already a few we've done for flat tappets. Yeah, you know, and it's been a lot of fun doing that. Uh, Even for the 875 flat tappets. Wally wants to know, how do I select a cam if I don't know all the specs of the head's geometry? You know, that's what, you know, a lot of people call me up trying to pick camshafts, and, and I'm horrible at it. You know, like literally horrible at it. Uh, you know, what I can do is help with profile selection, which profiles you want to run. I can help with um, engine theory. You know, I really love engine theory. But our sales guys, if you get in touch with somebody in our engine builder or technical sales lines, they can really, really walk you through what needs to happen to pick out a cam profile. Um, you know, if you ever want a good, good joke, you can ask ask John Kazi, ask Warren, ask um, Ed Pink, ask um, any of these, Ben Trader, any of these guys. I'm not good at picking camshafts. I'm good at designing loads, and then somebody else has to pick the camera. All right, multiple questions about marine applications, big block Chevrolet powered marine applications. Mm -hmm. No, um, you know, we've had a absolute blast with that. We actually have a a whole different series. It's our MPZ series um, that we make for marine applications and big block Chevy applications, especially 1130 seconds. You have to understand that those valve masses are so much higher than what you see in typical LS small block Chevy world that they really require their own designs. But we have um, just had tremendous success in the marine world, in the big block world with some new profiles. Excellent. Adam wants to know, he says a lot of people are always looking for horsepower, but with trucks, uh, we need torque. So he wants to know about your best torque based cams uh, for a stroked LS. So he's looking for torque rather than horsepower. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing is like if you if you paid attention to some of the little subtleties of presentation, I've talked about how the low shock often makes the camshaft act small if you don't change the center lines and the durations. Well, usually that's bad, right? But in an application where you do want to increase torque and you do want to make the bottom end stronger, the low shot plays right into exactly what you want to do. Excellent, excellent. Um, just some general. So one thing, one thing I'll tell people, um, you know, pay a lot of attention if you're trying to increase torque at the very low part of the torque curve. Look a lot at what you saw with the engine masters. You know, where they had to run at 2,500 to 3,500 RPM. Exhaust opening plays a much bigger role in that very early torque because it increases the power stroke. You know, one of the things, if you're really trying to focus on the bottom end, a lot of times you'll see people run less exhaust duration than intake duration. So not only would I recommend going to a low shot profile, but I'd also recommend less exhaust duration, tighten up, tightening up the load, load separation. Excellent. You know, a lot of people look at load separations, what's doing it. What I'm really doing by tightening load separation isn't changing the overlap because I'm coming off the, in, the exhaust duration. What I'm really doing is just moving the exhaust over. Billy, this has been fantastic. I know there's a lot of people out there watching with many more questions. We're getting ready to move on to our Spintron conversation. Why don't you give the folks out there some information where they can contact you guys, the folks at Comp Cams, to continue their journey uh, with this uh, really like live R&D session. If they've got questions for their engines, what should they do, where should they go? Yeah, please go to our website. It's www.compcams.com. If they can go there, get in with our tech guys, um, the guys who run that office, who do the internet stuff, they do a tremendous job. We can get you with our salesmen. We'll try to do a best job. Um, no, most of those guys over there, they're my close friends. We all work together on these projects. So don't feel like you're ever not in good hands. We'll try to do everything we can for you. 
and guys really enjoy Ben's Ben's deal. He's a close personal friend. He's um you know he's been here several times. We work together all the time. I hope you really enjoy his presentation. I can't wait to watch it. I am excited as well, Billy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a great day. Be Excellent. good. Excellent. He's an idea. I didn't get him again with the wide right. That's only working once. Uh, <laughs> we are working our way. I love hearing what he said about Factory Showdown. Those of you who follow the National Hot Rod Association on a regular basis, you know there's been it's controversy over there. Oh, yeah. Right? you got all these different... Even I know that. You've got these <laughs> manufacturers, and it's just a situation where they're trying to keep everything equal, but guys like Billy, it's their job to make sure things are not equal and that their guys win. And so we got a little news right there. Very exciting. All right, so we're working our way through the valve train. You mentioned Sky High RPM Lake, and uh, those things are found with a certain bit of machinery, and we're gonna learn a little bit about it. Spintron, here comes Ben Strader right now. What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars, we are not going to listen. 